Good afternoon, everybody! Hello! Hello! My name is Parker, and I'm the educational curator for T-Rex, the Ultimate Predator, and I'll be your Science World host for today. I'm joining you here from inside the dome at Science World. Super exciting. Can't wait. And before we begin, I'd like to first acknowledge gratefully that we are on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And of course, we're very grateful to be able to live, work, and play on these lands. I personally absolutely love to go hiking, and I think I actually might be going uh, on Saturday, which is super exciting. Now, uh, as you might notice to the right of this video, you'll see our chat box, which is where you'll be able to help us out by asking and answering questions throughout. And you might notice that um, throughout, we might actually call on you to help us out, uh, and then you can respond with a comment or a question, or you might actually have a question that comes to your mind. Feel free to type that out into our chat box. And then if we don't answer it right away, that's because we're saving it for the question and answer session at the end. So we'll save the last 10 minutes of today for a Q&A session so you can answer, ask your questions throughout or at the end there. And we'll definitely give you a chance there as well. Now, I think what we should do is sort of warm up our brains, warm up our fingers, and try to practice using that chat box over there. So if you can, type in the chat, where are you coming in from today? Where are you coming in from today? And as we wait for some responses, we also want to thank RBC and White Swat Restaurants for making events like this possible for us to do, which is really great. Oh, love to be able to do things like this and show you around. Oh, super cool. Da, 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 da. Who do we have here coming in? And again, you can type in the chat there and type in, where are you coming in from today? So we're here from Vancouver. Woo! I know I definitely have family over in Ontario and Toronto, and I have friends and family in the UK in Australia, which is really fun. Very cool. Do, 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 do. Da, 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 da. Nice. Jocelyn's coming in from Salt Spring. Rebecca from North Carolina. Wow, super cool. And we have someone from Abbotsford from home. Amazing. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Serena. Oh, amazing. Maple Ridge. Oh, so much fun. Woohoo. Jennifer from New York, amazing, love it. Oh, super cool. Oh, thank you so much. Today, we will actually be joined by Daniel Gowerlich from the Pacific Museum of Earth at the University of British Columbia, right here in Vancouver. We'll start with an interactive workshop and then have a live Q&A session in the last, last 10 minutes, just like we mentioned before. And of course, as mentioned, feel free to pop in your questions at any point in time. Now, I would like to introduce Daniel from the Pacific Museum of Earth. Now, PME is Vancouver's premier earth science museum, providing an educational window into topics that engage, excite, and educate students, teachers, and the community about fundamental science and its linkages to topics of environmental, economic, and societal importance. Please welcome and give a big round of applause to Daniel. Hello, everybody. Thanks for that enthusiastic welcome, Parker. I'll try and <laughs> match your enthusiasm level or energy levels. Um, yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Pacific Museum of Earth. Uh, okay, do you see my slide properly? Woo. My slides are up properly? Excellent. Okay, so welcome to the Pacific Museum of Earth. Uh, I always like to say that we are UBC's oldest museum, but also the one that very few people know about. So if you've never heard of us before and you are from Vancouver, don't worry, uh, you were in the majority. <laughs> Uh, now, this museum, just like the rest of UBC, is located on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. So we uh, thank them for being our hosts. Uh, this museum is located at UBC, but I know that campus can be a bit of a labyrinth. Uh, most of our collection is in this building over here. Uh, that's the one that's in the photograph down here. This is our front door. This is my office that I'm speaking to you from today. But we also have some satellite displays in this newer building, which is right on Main Mall opposite from the Beattie Biodiversity Museum. So if you know where the big blue whale skeleton is, uh, we're across the street. 
We are the museum of the Department of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, that's the largest department within the Faculty of Science here at UBC, and we cover a lot of ground both literally and figuratively. We've got all kinds of scientists, uh, atmospheric scientists. Those are people who study the bubble of gas which surrounds our planet. Climate scientists, people who study long-term weather patterns. Environmental scientists, people who study the impacts of human activities upon the environment. And of course, we have plenty of fossil scientists. Uh, what do we call those kinds of scientists? The scientists who study fossils. What's their fancy name? Fossilologists. Fossilologists. <laughs> <laughs> Any suggestions? Yeah, anybody have any ideas? What do we call those scientists who study fossils? Viviana! <laughs> Angeloist. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Very close. <laughs> so they are paleontologists. I know it's a bit of a mouthful. Often they get confused with archaeologists. Uh, they both kind of sound very similar, and they both spend a lot of time digging in the dirt. But archaeologists study things made by people, and paleontologists study evidence of life from before modern humans. Uh, this is one of our paleontologists. Uh, this is Dr. Kirsten Brink. She uh, got her PhD in paleontology, and she was fascinated with the evolution of teeth. Uh, so she went back for a postdoc degree in dentistry. So she thoroughly understands the history of teeth, where teeth are at right now, and now she's working on the future of teeth. She just opened a lab at the University of Manitoba where she's trying to find ways to get humans to regrow teeth that they've lost. So it's not something you'd expect a paleontologist to be doing, but it's a really exciting and unexpected application of her science. This is Dr. Louise Longridge. Uh, she studies Jurassic ammonites, and we'll explore ammonites later on. Uh, so if you don't know what they are, don't worry. Uh, we'll cover them quite intensively. And this is Marianne Wong. Uh, now you'll notice I didn't say Dr. Marianne Wong. Uh, Marianne is, or was my volunteer. Uh, she actually ran our fossil lab for many years. Uh, and she's completely self-taught in terms of paleontology. Uh, but she has great connections with paleontologists all around the world. And so she goes on digs with professional paleontologists all the time. A few years ago, just before the pandemic, she was on a dig with some of the staff at the Royal Terrell Museum. And they were walking over a, or through a field to a new fossil bed. And as they walked through this field, Marianne said, hey, there's something under that bush over there. And the paleontologists uh, scoffed and said, no, 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 uh, we've walked this ground a thousand times before. There's nothing here. We found all the fossils. But Marianne was insistent. She said, no, there's definitely something under that bush. As you can see in this photograph, Marianne is a shorter person. And the paleontologists that she was with were six feet tall and taller. They were all very uh, tall gentlemen. And so because Marianne was slightly shorter, she literally had a different perspective on the landscape. And as a result, she did see something under that bush. As they started digging, they found uh, part of a Tyrannosaurus jawbone. It was such an exciting discovery, they uh, wrote an entire paper on it. So that just goes to show that it's very important to have a diverse team. In this case, superficially diverse, uh, different heights. Uh, but having a diverse team gives you different perspectives and allows you to make discoveries that you might have missed otherwise. Amazing. And Marianne, I met, I was so lucky to be able to meet Marianne. She's like the kindest human I've ever met in my life. I was oh, amazed yeah. to be able to chat to her. She's one of my favorite people. <laughs> and she'll bend over backwards to help anyone. But let's head into the museum. Our museum is divided into four main themes. We have ancient life or fossils, Earth's treasures or rocks, gems, and minerals, our powerful planet or natural disasters, and finally, the Omniglobe. But today we're talking about ancient life. Today we're talking about fossils. What is a fossil or how do we define a fossil? Mm. And to let you know, Daniel, it looks like also the chat just has a short delay. 
oh, as okay. well. Um, so as we're waiting for some responses to what is a fossil, uh, I'll let you know. I know Sophia uh, mentioned, oh, a paleontologist. You guys didn't wait for me. And uh, <laughs> Melissa, as we're waiting for these answers to what is a fossil, Melissa uh, was wondering if any new dinosaurs have been found lately. Oh, that's a great question. Um, paleontology, I know it sounds like a dusty old field, but it's actually really exciting. And new discoveries are being made every single day. So I'm not sure what the, the latest dinosaur is, but I do know that we're finding new ones all the time. Amazing. Awesome. So we have some responses from some folks as to what is a fossil. Viviana, it's from a dead thing. John is remains and or footprints from dead creatures. And uh, some agreement from Viviana there. <laughs> Those are great, uh, great definitions. The one that we're going to use today is evidence of life uh, preserved in rock. And I should also add, uh, here at UBC, we use the definition that it's evidence of life that is more than 10,000 years old uh, preserved in rock. We just use 10,000 as a nice, uh, clear uh, cutoff point. So we're going to look at two different types of fossils. Uh, the first category of fossils is what we often think of when we think of fossils. That is living things preserved in rock. Those are body fossils. So when you think of uh, you know, bones, teeth, claws, uh, in this case, we've got a fish that's been preserved in rock. Uh, so that's, again, what we often think of when we think of fossils. But then there's a whole other category of fossils that's equally important, and that is evidence of life preserved in rock. Those are trace fossils. So uh, I believe John mentioned footprints, right? Skin prints. These weren't part of the ancient organism, but they tell us about the ancient organism. Okay, make sense? I'm now curious as to what fossils I've, I'm leaving behind as I live my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope I leave behind fossils. <laughs> okay, do we understand the difference between body and trace fossils? Are we ready to play body Woo. and trace? <laughs> so again, you can put in the chat a uh, B or a T for body or trace fossils. So the first specimen, these fish in our collection, these are from the Green River Formation uh, in the US. But are they body fossils or trace fossils? Mm. Hmm. Parker, yeah. do you have a guess? Nice. It's tough. I'm wondering if you're trying to trick me as well, because I know I could like, you know, sort of like taking like a leaf or something and then like just getting its shape or something like that. I feel like I could do the same thing with fish and get something like this, but it's, it does look like the body, I think. So I think I am in agreement with most of our folks. <laughs> Viviana says tuna. Uh, <laughs> Tom says like B. Um, Leonard says either B or T, I'm guaranteed to be correct. Uh, that is probably true. Uh, and Jennifer B, Viviana, body fossils. Nice, awesome. Excellent. So yeah, I will go with the crowd and say B. We are a smart group today. They are body fossils. This dinosaur footprint, this is actually a replica of a dinosaur footprint, uh, which is on the wall mm -hmm. in the BD Biodiversity Museum. Um, believe it or not, BC is actually home to some of the best dinosaur trackways in the world. And they weren't found by someone with a fancy PhD. They were actually discovered by relatively young children, uh, people who were four or five years old. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Parker, one of your colleagues over at Science World actually grew up with one of those uh, children. Get out. Yeah. And <laughs> Larry is sitting beside me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. That's amazing. Holy. Did You've you get to celebrity. see that? I touched them. Oh, Larry's touching them. That's cool. It's, it must be amazing also to just come across footprints of an animal you've clearly never seen before. And to imagine, oh, does something like live around here or did something used to live around here that looks like something I've never seen? And yeah, that's a really, really fun thing. Absolutely. 
But again, it just goes to show you don't have to have a fancy degree to make a major discovery in paleontology. So Viviana is saying T, Chris is saying uh, Trace, Aaron is also going for T, Melissa T. Awesome. Ah, we are a smart group today. <laughs> Up next, it gets a little harder. This leaf from the Kitsilano region. Ooh. So here in Vancouver, this one sometimes throws people for a loop. I'm still like hung up on in the Kitsilano region. Yeah. So, what? <laughs> yeah, Kitsilano has loads of leaf fossils. These ones aren't Crazy. terribly old. Uh, they're only about 20 million years old-ish. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> oh, amazing. I've walked that beach so many times. I used to live in that area. Oh, incredible. Oh, Kitts Beach has apparently a cave beautiful fossils. I've looked since, I know you told me this like a month ago and I've looked and I just, I can't seem to find it. I think I need to go with somebody on the team. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're getting a whole myself. bunch of answers here. Uh, let's see, Tom is thinking maybe B. Leonard is actually wondering, is this a leaf footprint or a leaf remain? Ah, so that oh, would cool. be the question, body or trace. So body, Gregory, trace since the leaf has decayed. Uh, Viviana T-Rex, uh, Megumi is body, Manisha, fish, John T, uh, and AW Dev. It is the body of a dead leaf. I don't think it could be a leaf impression in the rock that would be visible millions of years later. Very cool. So this Love one it. is a body fossil. Uh, we often forget that plants have bodies, right? But this is actually part of the, the plant's body. Uh, when you cracked open this piece of shale, on one side you'd see a very thin body fossil, and on the other side you'd see an almost identical trace fossil. But the trace fossil would be the same color as the rock around it. So because this is a different color, you can tell mm. that this is actually the body. Wow. Okay, are we ready for round two? It gets harder. Sorry, um, Daniel, can yeah. you tell what kind of plant that is by looking at that leaf? Oh, yes. Um, looks fairly modern, uh, like an elm. Uh, yeah, but a lot of ancient uh, plants and animals are actually still with us today. Oh, wow. Some of the earliest organisms are actually uh, still with us with very few changes. Oh, man, that's so cool. Here's a beautiful ammonite shell from Madagascar uh, in our collection. So ammonites are the ancestors of octopi and squid. So there'd be a bunch of tentacles sticking out the end here. It's a beautiful piece. It's uh, iridescent, which is when you see all these colors. We always think of fossils as being dusty old rocks, uh, but in cases like this, you can see that they're actually quite beautiful in, at times. So that's a rock and not a shell. Sorry? A rock and not like a shell? It's a recrystallized uh, seashell. Oh, cool. As I understand it. So the cool. original elements uh, that made up that shell are still with us, but they're organized in a different pattern. Mm, very cool. Mm. Oh, wow. But do we think it's body or trace? Let's see, Leonard's thinking uh, T ammonites are like squids that live in shellies, and their shellies are traces. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, A.W. Deb, T, thank you. Jennifer, body, very cool. Uh, John is also T. Oh, amazing. I honestly have no idea. I am, yeah, for this particular, I've, I, I'm so lost, I'm not sure. So in this case, it is a body fossil. Oh, nice. The shell is like the squid's uh, skeleton, but instead of having the bones on the inside of its body, the bones are on the outside of its body. Uh, so it's an exoskeleton. Ooh, uh, nice. We often think that uh, organisms would swap out shells, and some organisms do do that, but not ammonites. Uh, they keep this th shell for its entire life. Just like I can't swap out my, my skeleton, right? 3D model would be easier. Oh, so cool. Oh, this brilliant. coprolite. Uh, now, what on earth is a coprolite? What are we looking at? Parker, do you have any guesses? Oh, I know the answer to this one. 
What is it? Does anybody have any ideas? I don't want to give it away. <laughs> Might be a trace, but does anybody know what a coprolite is a fossil of? Yeah, or have any guesses to what it might be? Body or trace, what is it? What does that kind of look like? Jennifer, dino poop! Dinosaur poop? <laughs> Do you really think I'd be showing you a photograph of dinosaur poop? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> I absolutely would be showing you dinosaur poop. Great job, Jennifer. <laughs> so sometimes a dinosaur's poop will be petrified, will be turned into rock. Uh, you can tell a lot about an animal by what comes out of it. Um, for example, if you've ever seen a cow poop or a yak poop or an elephant poop, it just kind of pancakes when it hits the ground. Those three animals have a very high fiber uh, plant-based diet right? Cows, yaks, and elephants. They're all very gentle animals. Um, this do doesn't look like it pancaked when it hit the ground. It looks like it has more integrity. It kept its shape. Uh, this looks like a, a dog's poop or a cat's poop or a wolf's poop. Uh, those three animals all have some meat in their diet. So I would suspect that whatever organism made this poop probably had some meat in its diet as well. If I wanted to confirm that, I could actually slice it open and look for undigested remains. I m might find uh, some bone fragments, uh, fossilized bone fragments, or some fossilized seeds in there, and that would tell me what it was mm -hmm. eating. But I should get back to the uh, important question, body or trace? <laughs> what is the copper like? Viviana is saying, ooh. Aaron <laughs> is saying, poop. Uh, <laughs> Megumi is body, um, and let's see, Helena's, ew, 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 <laughs> uh, and then Leonard's saying, so pancake or meatball, and those are our two options for poop. <laughs> I guess it would be pancake or meatball, or I've also seen, like, pebbles with, like, uh, deer and uh, rabbits, I guess. Absolutely. Who makes the, the cubic poo? Oh, I've heard of this. A wombat? Yes, really? that's it. Oh, cool. <laughs> I don't think I've actually heard of this. Now I have to secretly look up wombat poop. Uh, amazing. So we're also seeing a T, uh, let's see, trace, because the dinosaur left it behind. Oh, cool. And Jennifer's body. And Melissa has a question. And Melissa, what we'll do is we'll save that question for the Q&A session, but I'll definitely get Daniel to answer that one at the end. Excellent. And Leonard's thinking trace, big poo poo, and another T at the bottom. Nice. So it absolutely is a trace fossil. Uh, just like our poop isn't a part of us once it's come out, uh, this poop isn't a part of the dinosaur. It's mm. uh, something the dinosaur left behind. Great thinking. Mm. Next, awesome. we have a gastrolith. Now, again, what on earth is a gastrolith? Many dinosaurs were terrible chewers. They would take great big mouthfuls of food and swallow it whole. I don't recommend doing that. It is terrible for your digestion. You want to break up your food into smaller, more manageable pieces. But these dinosaurs had a trick up their sleeves. They would swallow rocks. The rocks go down into their stomach, roll around, bang up against each other and crush their food for them. That's why this rock is so smooth. It's been tumbled and polished in dinosaur stomach acid. When it gets to be this smooth, the dinosaur will vomit it back up. But you know my question, body or trace? What are we saying, Parker? Ooh. My guess, my guess <laughs> is that it might be a trace because if the poop is trace, my guess is the gastrolith might be as well, because it's also leaving it behind. It's sort of evidence of the creature, but not the creature itself. Mm -hmm. hmm. Help them eat. Dinosaurs eat. Gregory's also thinking trace. Oh, wait a second. Oh? I think you might be trying to trick me right now. <laughs> I think you... Okay. I would never try to trick you, Parker. <laughs> Let me see this. I think it might. Okay. So, okay. Maybe trace. Maybe body. Maybe both. I oh. don't know. So gastroliths themselves are trace fossils. Oh. 
But if anyone said body, you're kind of right in this case. Do you see this oval mark over here and over here? Hundreds of millions of years ago, before even the earliest dinosaurs were alive, there was an ancient sea filled with these early squid. They died, were lucky enough to be preserved in rock. Then millions of years later, the sea dried up. A dinosaur came along, found this already ancient fossil, and ate it, meaning that this is both a body and a trace fossil. Ah! So, either way you voted, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I had a feeling. I had a feeling. Uh, okay, weird question from, from me, Daniel. Yeah. Okay, so you see like where those uh, body fossils are. So I just sort of see these grooves in the rock. How do you like? How do you be able to identify that as being a fossil? Oh, great question. Um, so I personally, I my eyes aren't good enough to be able to identify that. Uh, but our paleontologists uh, spend a lot of time figuring out what isn't isn't a fossil. So um, yeah, people who know better uh, can identify them. <laughs> Oh, really cool. I know with like bones in like the T-Rex uh, fossil that we have, our T-Rex um, fossil cast that we have here, like every bump and every groove is some sort of uh, clue to its story. So uh, I've never really looked at rocks. So maybe the same is true of rocks as well. Mm -hmm. So cool. Okay. Let's take a look at three ways of making a fossil. These aren't the only three, but these are three of the most common ways of making a fossil. Uh, so mineral replacement, unaltered material, and molds and casts. Let's start off with mineral replacement. Just as that poo is not poo anymore, um, most of our fossils aren't their original material. They've been replaced with minerals. Uh, so the shell isn't a shell anymore. This wood isn't wood anymore. Uh, they are now mineralized. So here we have our friend the fish swimming along, and then at the end of its life, it does what every living thing eventually does, it dies. Uh, now, I don't know about any of you, I skipped lunch today, and that fish is looking pretty good. Uh, Parker, do you like eating yeah. fish meat? I do. Salmon, I think, is my favorite um, food. <laughs> Excellent. And how about fish bones? No. No, that's <laughs> I usually pick those out. So just like uh, with Parker and, and myself, uh, there are many organisms out there that love to eat the nice, soft, uh, fleshy parts of an organism. Uh, so the meat, the organs, uh, the skin. There are very few uh, organisms, though, that want to eat the harder bits, the bones, the teeth, the claws. And so that's why that stuff often sits around long enough and has uh, a longer time uh, to be preserved. That's not to say that the soft bits can't be preserved. It's just much rarer. A friend of mine actually discovered some fossilized jellyfish uh, on the shores of Hudson Bay, and they're all soft tissue, so it is possible. Again, it's just much rarer. So the soft bits get consumed by uh, other organisms. Sometimes microbes will eat it. Then the skeleton itself gets buried. And that's really helpful. Being buried uh, protects the skeleton, uh, keeps it from being disturbed. But also, in this shallow, watery grave, uh, water starts to flow through the bones. That water is full of minerals. The minerals will collide with the molecules that make up the skeleton and knock them out of place. But then the minerals get stuck in the exact same spot. It's kind of like Newton's cradle. The game at the ball bearings on people's desks, you let go of one ball bearing and they go back and forth, right? So the minerals come along, collide with the molecules that make up the uh, skeleton, knock them out of place, but then the minerals get stuck in the exact same spot. So molecule by molecule, the skeleton washes away and mineral by mineral, uh, the fossil gets created. Then in a place like BC, where we have two pieces of Earth's surface smashing into each other, our underwater fossil can be raised up into the mountains. We actually find tons and tons of marine fossils uh, up in our mountains. Uh, 
then you can have some erosion. Erosion is when natural forces will destroy a part of the landscape. And that sounds really bad, but it's actually really beneficial. It means the paleontologists don't have to dig that deep uh, to get these ancient fossils. And then our friend, the paleontologist, discovers this fossil and brings it to the museum. Okay. Danny, you just like, you gotta give me a second. That just blew my mind. <laughs> it's a really cool process, but it only happens to a small fraction of any uh, living material. Mm. Only a teeny tiny fraction of any living life uh, will ever be fossilized or petrified in this case. Let's so it's like the and it's the bones like less likely to be the softer tissues because they'll like break down. And I know we had a, a bit of a question earlier on um, if like it needed to be for copper lights, if it needed to be like a really big animal's poop because it would have broken down uh, because it's so soft. Oh, great question. Um, Christ, nice. <laughs> so, oh. A bigger poop would probably have a better chance of being petrified, just because, like you said, there is more of it. Uh, but even small poops uh, can be petrified as well. Mm. We tend okay. to think of ancient life as all being enormous. Uh, but ancient life would have the same range of sizes that we have today. Uh, we it tend to um, skew towards larger organisms because they're easier to find. I mean, if you're walking along and there's a Tyrannosaurus sticking out of the ground, it's hard to miss that. But also, the larger organisms are the ones that museums tend to show because that's what the public wants to see, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I love you know, that. No one gets really excited about a chicken-sized dinosaur, right? Okay, let's talk about original material. Unaltered material. So where we have original stuff from thousands or even millions of years ago. Uh, who's going to see the, the upcoming, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Jurassic World movies? Where did they get the DNA to build their dinosaurs? I think, is it sap or is it resin? I think. Ah. So amber is resin, uh, not ah. fossilized tree sap. We often think of it as tree sap. But a tree sap is like its blood. The tree wants to keep that inside it. But accidents happen. Sometimes I get cut. Parker, I'm sure sometimes you get cut, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. And when that happens, we lose some of our blood, right? But we don't lose all of it. Our bodies will make a scab over the wound to keep our blood inside us. Some trees do the exact same thing. When they get injured, so they don't lose all of their version of blood, their sap, uh, they'll secrete a sticky substance over the wound. And that hardens to become resin. Because it's sticky, Ooh. it's great at trapping insects, seeds, plant material. And in 2015, a paleontologist found some uh, fossilized tree resin, which contained this. He picked up this piece in an amber market in Myanmar because he thought it contained a really interesting fern. But that doesn't look like a fern to me. How about you, Parker? It looks like little, like, hairs of sorts. And then I also see sort of like an ant-like thing, yeah. some sort of insect up top. He very quickly realized his mistake. He wasn't holding ferns. He was holding feathers. He was holding the tip of a dinosaur's tail. And it's the first time we've actually retrieved original material from a dinosaur. He sent it to the world's leading amber specialist who is at the University of Saskatchewan of all places. So almost right next door to us. <laughs> now did, we're like, all... did Jurassic Park know this? Ah. Is this? I should also point out, uh, we can't unfortunately do Jurassic Park, um, <laughs> even trapped in amber. Uh, the DNA would degrade after at most a million years, and even after a few thousand mm. years, it's fairly useless. Very cool. <laughs> so Jurassic Park is still fantasy, uh, partial, partially unfortunately, but also partially uh, very fortunately, because um, <laughs> 
while I would love to live with the T-Rex, I also would not want to live with the T-Rex. <laughs> We also have original material from a more recent time period, the Ice Age. So you may recognize this woolly mammoth from the Royal BC Museum. Uh, as uh, permafrost around the globe melts, we're finding some amazingly preserved uh, fossils from ancient life. So here you can see a perfectly preserved uh, mammoth cub, I believe from Siberia. Okay, let's talk about molds and casts. So here we don't have seashells. We've got the casts of seashells. So this, the shells themselves decomposed while the mud that encased them was preserved in rock. And then sometimes these casts will get filled in with mud or sand or dirt, making a perfect mold of the original mm. organism. I like to think of this like uh, the, the mold, sorry, is the uh, cake pan and the cast is the cake itself. Make sense? I love that. Thanks. I like to think of everything in terms of food. Um, <laughs> and now I want an ammonite like sponge cake. <laughs> yes, me too. Oh, I'll be making that on the weekend, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, finally, let's talk about dating our fossils. Uh, looking at this cliff, where would we expect to find the oldest fossils? Uh, up here? Over here? Over here? Or here? Parker, where would you expect to find the oldest fossils? Hmm. <laughs> I think this comment is from earlier, but AW Dev uh, was responding to Leonard saying the leg has to fossilize first. And I. <laughs> I don't think they're talking about the person standing there, but I love the context uh, put in this place. It's really good. Uh, so I am kind of gonna go to go with that. Maybe um, right near the foot of our person there. Yeah. And AW Dev. Oh, nice. Is saying John is saying the lowest levels too. Thanks, John. Uh, and AW Dev because sediment layered over time. Pretty cool. And Aaron's saying the bottom as well. Thank you. We are a smart group today. You intuitively understand the law of superposition. And that simply states that older rocks get covered up by younger rocks. But do you think our underground is that simple? Absolutely not. Um, again, here in BC, we live on the edge of a global car crash. Two pieces of Earth's surface are smashing into each other. So these nice flat layers can be jolted to the sides. Here. Again, we get our layering, and we can have some kind of disturbance, which jolts our layers on the side. We can have some more erosion, which again is when part of the rock record gets erased, and then more deposition on top of that. But again, our underground is not that simple. Again, here in BC, uh, we have two pieces of Earth's surface smashing into each other. When two things smash into each other, they run the risk of being damaged. You can, uh, they can get cracked. If you crack the surface of Earth and that crack runs deep enough, what's going to shoot up into the crack? But lava. So here we see some frozen lava, which is shot up into this crack, uh, filling it, uh, giving us some very young rock. Even though this rock is deeper than the rock around it, it is younger than the rock around it. The, all this rock had to have existed uh, in order for this uh, basalt to shoot through it. So again, here we have our nice layers and here we have our rock shooting through it. What color is the youngest rock in this diagram? Can we identify which color is youngest? My guess is either red or gray. Ah, so in this case, it would be the, the gray or the black layer, right? Because it shoots through all the other layers. After that, we would have yellow, then green, then blue, then red and on and on. 
And so by like the youngest, so that means um, it's like it most recently changed into like a solid and became exactly. sort of its solid form. Yeah. Before this, it was a liquid. Okay. This is called relative dating. You are dating your fossils uh, with uh, relative to the rock you find around them. Uh, it's fairly complicated, right? And it's kind of tough to wrap your head around. It would be useful if there was a more absolute way of dating your fossils. And there is. It's called absolute dating. By measuring or by looking at the zircon crystals in your fossils, you can tell exactly how old your fossil is. You can send your fossil to a fancy lab like this one here at UBC. It's actually right in the museum's foyer. And they can uh, study the zircon crystals and tell you exactly how old your fossil is. If absolute dating is so uh, accurate, why do we do any relative dating at all? Why don't we just send all our fossils to this lab? Hmm. Looks, looks like it takes a lot of effort to get something in there. It does. <laughs> and does this machinery look cheap? If you no? send something to this lab, <laughs> they're going to have to charge you a lot of money to process it. So um, unless you're made of money, you want to be a good relative dater. Mm. And do you think this machinery uh, works quickly? <laughs> mm. These scientists are very concerned about being accurate. So they work very, mm. very slowly, uh, very carefully. So it takes a long, long time uh, for them to process your fossils. Whereas if I can tell how old my fossil is just by where I found it or the rocks that are around it, uh, how long does that take me? It's instantaneous, right? So to be a good paleontologist, you have to be good at relative dating. And that's what we're going to do today. Today, we're actually not going to be paleontologists. Today, we're going to be anti-paleontologists. Instead of pulling fossils out of the ground, we're going to put them back into the ground in the right locations. So if you have a pen and paper, uh, this is where it's going to come in, in handy. Uh, if you don't have a pen and paper, now's the time to go and get some. I'm going to show you some fossils. Uh, this one is petrified wood. It is 230 MYA. Uh, MYA stands for million years ago. We often think of scientific abbreviations as being these long, complicated, uh, hard to pronounce terms, but in this case, it's exactly what it looks like. So I'm going to show you a few fossils with their ages. And I'm going to get you to put them or list them in order from youngest to oldest. So feel free to just list uh, the number and the age. Don't worry about the name or the MYA. And then just when you're done, put it into the chat, okay? So again, go from youngest to oldest. So we've got petrified wood and ammonite. Again, there'd be tentacles sticking out the end. This is a trilobite from our collection, a metamorphic rock, a dinosaur bone, some basalt, some very sparkly coral, an echinoid, I'll explain what that is later on, a shark tooth, a fern, and a brachiopod. Parker, I think you've seen most of these. Do you have a favorite? I always, it's a favorite thing of mine to use my phone light to illuminate oh. things like leaves or rocks and a lot of things sort of become lanterns, which is really cool. And so the echinoid is probably my favorite because it glows this really beautiful orange color. Yes. We have one specimen that I brought to Science World and showed off, and it was uh, replaced with a semi-transparent mineral. And so because the mineral is semi-transparent, uh, the fossil is also semi-transparent. And so when light enters it, it gets diffused. And like you said, it glows like a beautiful lantern. This uh, echinoid is oh, pretty solid, so it wouldn't glow. Oh, nice. So it wasn't this exact one that I had seen. No. 
Was the thing that I saw an echinoid though? Was that what you brought in? Yeah. Okay. Just a different echinoid. Okay. These are actually from our in-person fossil workshops. Uh, so um, we hand out these kits to the students and they get to handle them uh, and pass them around. Um, yeah, it's always super fun. But each kit is a little different uh, because, you know, no two fossils are the same. Okay. Oh. And how are we doing with the sorting? Are we all sorted? <laughs> I think so. Uh, Annie, I think, just sort of randomized it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's check our results. So our younger speci or youngest specimen is the shark tooth. Then we have the dinosaur bone, followed by that echinoid, then the ammonite at 150 MYA, petrified wood, basalt, the fern, brachiopod, coral, trilobite, and finally the metamorphic rock. Okay. So now that we have our fossils sorted, let's put them back into the ground. The shark tooth, being the youngest fossil, will go into the yellow layer, right? At 15 million years ago. Uh, this shark tooth is nice. It's a pity we don't have a tooth from the largest shark that, oh, that ever lived, the uh, megalodon. So here you can see our megalodon tooth compared to an average, well, pretty large shark tooth uh, from our collection. Sharks tend to have very shallow roots in their teeth because they're always tearing out their old teeth to make room for new teeth. Up next, we have the dinosaur bone at 66 million years old. It goes in the next layer. Uh, this dinosaur bone shows you something that paleontologists often have to deal with. You very rarely find a full intact bone in the ground. Instead, you often find fragments of bones. And then you have to very carefully piece them back together. So you can see this thigh bone in the museum, which has been carefully glued back together. It's like solving a puzzle, uh, a jigsaw puzzle, without knowing what the finished result's going to be. So if you enjoy solving puzzles, you may want to become a paleontologist. Up next is that echinoid. Which colored layer do we put the echinoid into? I guess it would be orange. Yeah, the orange layer. Now again, what on earth is an echinoid? It's a sea urchin. Wow, cool. Do you see it now? It's just lost its spikes. After that is the ammonite. Which color do we put the ammonite into? Hmm. I'm also like, I'm torn because I know you're going to try to trick me at some point. <laughs> I see that. I see that sort of purpley brown layer uh -huh. sticking up. <laughs> I'm absolutely going to try and trick you <laughs> coming up, Parker, <laughs> and everyone else. The ammonite goes in the brown layer. Uh, again, ammonites, uh, they lived for a few hundred million years as a family. And as a result, they really had a chance to diversify. Uh, some, most were uh, spiral shaped, but you could have some corkscrew shaped ones. Uh, you could have this trombone shaped one from Hornby Island. Wow. Sometimes you'll get some that have been recrystallized into the rarest gem on earth, like this specimen, uh, which we actually have on display in the gallery. Uh, this is a recrystallized seashell uh, that is only found here in Western Canada. It is rarer than diamonds, rubies, emeralds or sapphires. And again, it's only found in Western Canada. How big is this piece roughly, Daniel? This one's about the size of a dinner plate. So it's fairly large. 
And I'm glad you asked about sizes. Here's a teeny tiny one that one of our researchers discovered accidentally. He took a piece of rock, sliced it so thin he could actually shine light through it, and then uh, looked at it under a high powered microscope. Altogether, this entire image is less than two millimeters tall. So it's really tiny. And then you can have giant ones like this one uh, just outside Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. It's as tall as this woman. Okay, next we have our petrified wood. Which colored layer should we put our petrified wood into? That would red. Be a red <laughs> layer. Excellent. I love petrified wood. Uh, but it can be very confusing. On the outside, dinosaur bones and petrified wood look identical. To tell the difference, you have to look inside. Inside a bone, you'll find bubbles from the bone marrow. Whereas inside wood, you'll find rings. I find petrified wood incredibly beautiful and informative. Here are some specimens from our collection. And this is a specimen uh, from my office, actually. You can see the tree rings are as fat as a pen. Every year the tree's alive, it adds a ring. So the bigger the ring is, the more that tree grew in that year. So the fatter the ring is, the happier the tree was. The thinner the ring is, the more the tree struggled. So this tree was very happy and grew at an immense rate. Okay, up next we have the basalt. Which color do we put the basalt into? At 250 million years ago. Leonard says brown. Oh, Leonard, you didn't fall for my trick. <laughs> you are absolutely <laughs> right. The next layer is actually this maroon color, right? Even though it's lower than the blue, the blue layer had to have existed in order for the basalt to slice through it. So this is my tricky one. After the basalt, <laughs> oh yeah? Tom Harlan, <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> so now we get to the fern and the fern belongs in the blue layer. Remember before I mentioned that uh, soft material doesn't often fossilize, but it can be preserved. This fern didn't have bones, it didn't have teeth, it didn't have claws. It's pretty much all soft material, and yet it was still preserved. So again, soft tissue can be uh, fossilized under the right circumstances. Next, we have the brachiopod in the purple. Uh, what on earth is a brachiopod? It looks like a mustache. <laughs> but it's actually a very familiar creature. Here's a fossil of a more recent brachiopod. It's a shellfish. Uh, shellfish often get their food by filtering it out of the water with their tongues. But ancient shellfish had very unsophisticated clunky tongues. And so they developed a dent in the fronts of their shells. This divides the shell into two halves. They suck water into one side of their shell, filter out their food, then push the wastewater to the other side before jettisoning it. Modern shellfish have more sophisticated tongues and can do all of that uh, in the main shell in one single chamber or even outside the shells themselves. Okay, next we have coral in the green layer. And I'll be honest, I don't have anything interesting to say about coral. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I make up for it with all the cool stuff I have about trilobites. Trilobites are ancient sea bugs. They would scurry across shallow sea floors eating dead stuff. Like ammonites, they also lived for a few hundred million years as a family and really diversified. Here's a teeny tiny trilobite from our collection. You can see my house key for scale. And here's someone working on a replica of the largest trilobite ever found. It was found on the shores of Hudson Bay by a friend of mine. 
So here you can see the real trilobite in the background. If it were to stand up, it would come up uh, well, to my knees. So imagine all these teeny tiny little bug legs crawling up your leg just to say hello. Here's a crazy trilobite from Morocco. Uh, you can see it's got one eye over here, one eye over here, its legs on the side, and then this really weird head structure. And every holiday season, I like to bring out Rudolph the Red-Nosed Trilobite. Just gets me in the festive spirit. <laughs> Okay, our final specimen is the metamorphic rock in the blue section. Now, our metamorphic rock is about 600 million years old, uh, but that's nothing. One of the oldest rocks on Earth is a metamorphic rock. It's called the Acosta gneiss. It's a piece of gneiss from the Acosta region in northern Canada. It's just over 4 billion years old, what? making it about half a billion years younger than our planet. And uh, it is actually on display in our gallery. You can actually come by and touch it and reach back to the beginning of our home. So I invite you all to come by, visit the museum sometime and touch this rock, reach back to the beginning of Earth with me uh, and... Uh, be amazed. And congratulations now, everybody. You are now a certified PME anti-paleontologist, since you are now skilled at putting fossils back into the ground. Amazing. Thank you so much, Daniel. Let's give Daniel a huge round of applause. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, amazing. Uh, so we don't have too much time, but we'll save maybe uh, five minutes for a few questions. So if you have any questions, Please do type them into the chat and we'll ask Daniel. I know one person has asked, uh, Melissa, thank you so much, Larry, for putting that up. Uh, Melissa has asked a few times, is Argentina still the biggest dinosaur? This is not one that I've heard of, but maybe you know. Oh, so I think that's the Argentinosaurus. Uh, oh. It definitely is one of the largest ones. I don't know if it's still the largest one. Uh, every now and then they get, you know, kicked off the throne. <laughs> <laughs> but it definitely is amongst the biggest ones, for sure. Someone oh, got man. creeped up by the trilobites. Uh, absolutely. Ooh, Jennifer, what is the most scary and fierce dinosaur? Ooh, depends on what scares you the most. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, well, I guess trilobite would not be a dinosaur. So let's see. Yeah, the flying, like, pterosaurs seem like they would... Like some people have a bird phobia in general, so maybe just all dinosaurs would be scary to them. So oddly <laughs> enough, pterodactyls are not dinosaurs. Wow. They're pterosaurs. To be a dinosaur, you must live on land. If you live in the water or in the air, you get kicked out of the dinosaur club. So it's oh, actually amazing. a very exclusive club. Even though they lived at the same time as dinosaurs, uh, they are uh, not technically dinosaurs. Oh, cool. I love that. Let's see. Oh, uh, we have a question is, um, so is the, uh, you were talking about there was one uh, that was made of the rarest gem. So is it expensive? Yes and no. Uh, so um, I wouldn't be able to afford the piece that we have in the gallery. Uh, it is very expensive in that sense. But for being the rarest gem on earth, uh, it's so rare, not a lot of people know about it. And so there isn't the huge demand that you'd expect. So it is getting more known and getting more expensive right now. Uh, so I, if you're going to buy some, I'd recommend buying it now. Um, but it's still fairly affordable. Oh, amazing. Oh, love it. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for asking the question. That's great. That great um, question. So let's see. We have a few more here. Um, how much does the dating machine cost by AW Dev? And we'll take a few more questions after this, and that's all we'll have time for today. That's another great question. Uh, it'd be a few thousand dollars per specimen. So imagine if you're a paleontologist and you're finding thousands of specimens, you can't be paying thousands of dollars for each specimen to be uh, zircon dated. Amazing. Oh, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it. And Rebecca, do we think all dinosaurs have feathers or just some? Just some of them. Uh, so the ones that we believe had uh, feathers would be theropods. Those are dinosaurs that walk on two legs uh, and um, yeah, <laughs> like the T-Rex. And then uh, I'd say I'll take these a uh, few more uh, from Chris. 
is the recrystallization shell fossil still rare, even though you're right in the area to find it? It, it so is. So when you find it, is it everywhere around and no longer really that rare? It is very, very rare. Uh, it only occurs in some soil types, uh, the Bear Paw Formation in Alberta and a few places on the uh, Gulf Islands here in BC. And it only occurs with one or two species of ammonites. So remember, ammonites are a large, broad family, um, but only one or two species actually uh, get recrystallized in that way. Oh, brilliant. And our last two questions uh, from Megumi and Jennifer. Uh, what's the best site to see at Dinosaur Provincial Park? And what's your favorite dinosaur, personally? Oh, that is a great question. Um, so Dinosaur Provincial Park is an amazing place, uh, although I haven't been there since I was a child, so I don't actually remember. Um, but I mean, the whole place is just amazing. If you're looking for something to do this summer, I definitely recommend making the trek out there. Um, Alberta actually has another uh, newer dinosaur museum called the Philip J. Curie Museum, uh, and they're fabulous. Uh, they're a little more out of the way, but they're less uh, uh, trafficked, and it's a little more of an intimate experience when you go there. And for my favorite dinosaur, I'm a little biased. Here at the museum, we actually have uh, a lambiosaur, or which is a type of hadrosaur, so a duck-billed dinosaur. And so uh, that is, of course, one of my favorites. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Daniel. And thank you so much, everybody, for your questions. I apologize that we couldn't get to them all, uh, but Daniel is seeing them. And maybe, Daniel, what we can do is try to answer some of them in the comments of uh, the YouTube video. I think that might be good. Uh, so thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Daniel. Again, we can give you a huge round of applause. Thank you so much. This is really phenomenal. I loved it. You, thank like, you. blew my mind so many times. I really appreciate it, and I can't wait to check out some fossil hikes this summer if I can. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me today, and I hope you had fun. Woohoo! Nice. We'll keep exploring, everybody. Have an amazing rest of your day. Hopefully, we'll see you at Science World and the Pacific Museum of Earth sometime in the future. See you later, everybody. Bye.